हरे कृष्ण we are going to discuss chapter 5 from the bhagavad gita and we'll discuss this theme broadly about the search for pleasure but does anyone remember what was the point at which yesterday the chapter 4 ended krishna tells arjuna to take the sword of knowledge and fight remember that is rise and fight so now what happens for arjuna is that while krishna is using the word fight clearly metaphorically but still through much of the fourth chapter krishna has talked about sacrifice krishna has talked about you know going to a wise person and getting learning he krishna has focused much more on knowledge on the cultivation of knowledge as contrasted directly with fighting you see in the entire fourth chapter the reference to fighting comes only in the last verses where it says in the last verse only it says therefore arise and fight so it's what has happening here is that in chapter 4 yeah so the focus is on wisdom cultivating knowledge and various the wisdom by which now krishna is saying what kind of wisdom will come to that but and the conclusion is fight against doubt with the sword of wisdom so then arjuna has a question that does krishna really want me to fight this war also or not isn't it now when krishna has said wisdom is that enables us to recognize why to sacrifice how to sacrifice how sacrifice elevates us that was the theme again and again now i mentioned how the commentators tell that the whole kurukshetra war is like a battlefield sorry kurukshetra battlefield is like a massive sacrifice you remember that mm-hmm. yeah so because so then now that is not explicitly stated by krishna that is the commentary so arjuna is hearing his whole point of oh you know seek knowledge and with knowledge sacrifice so he he starts thinking that does krishna want me to sacrifice the kingdom and renounce the world <coughs> but krishna has earlier told me to fight so basically what happens is arjuna he has a question what is actually krishna telling me is he telling me to do sanyas sanyas means here eating of sanyas in terms of sacrifice or does he want me to do yoga the word yoga has many different meanings in the bhagavad gita so yoga here means primarily karma yoga so that is what krishna is talking about this this will involve action so he asks krishna do you want me to fight or do you want me to sacrifice in the sense of give a fight what is it that you want me to do please tell me clearly now in one sense if you see Arjuna has asked this question earlier when is it third chapter yes third chapter so if you see the same question is being repeated essentially now you will see 3.1 was the question 5.3.1 and 2 was the question 5.1 is the question now if you go further back 2.7 is also the same question essentially puchhami tvam dharma sammudhita i want to know what is dharma what is the right thing to do and among the right things to do it's whether to act or to not act whether to fight or to not fight and then at the end of the gita in 18.1 arjuna will again ask the same question in a slightly different way but essentially the same question now when the same question is repeated 
there are two ways not to answer that question one is to repeat the same answer because what will happen is the question is hey, you know my hearing is not the problem i heard your answer the last time i didn't get it that's why i'm asking the same question again so repeat the exact same answer that is unhelpful because that doesn't address the need of the audience the even worse thing to do is insult the intelligence of the question you fool i already answered the question were you not hearing where is your attention you are wasting my time how dumb can you be so now this is not only unhelpful that is actually downright unfriendly that is alienating so now the best way to actually address this is answer from a different perspective what is the different perspective here that the same point can be conveyed okay from this angle this angle this angle so what happens is like somebody is selling a house and they bring a prospective buyer nowadays on websites they put show the houses so you might see the house from inside you might see the house from outside you might see the house from top you might see the house from so each of these perspectives it can be a different selling point for the house oh inside it looks so pleasing outside it's so impressive from the top it's such a it's such a good locality so basically what happens is different pers perspectives may convince different buyers so house from outside oh it's impressive <coughs> from inside it's comfortable it's cozy from top it's in a great locality so different people may have different priorities so basically instead of repeating the same line a good seller will actually present from different perspectives so that is what krishna will do when he will answer this question when in the, now the third chapter and fifth chapters are somewhat similar but krishna is going to talk about karma yoga from a different perspective so essentially arjuna had two options one is renouncing work and engaging in work now we discussed how the gita divides all of these into further levels which have, we have not come to the verses specifically but remember arjuna is equating engaged with attached and disengaged with detached but krishna says it's not that simple now at this point krishna will answer that these are two distinct ways and both of them are good if this is the material level and this is the spiritual level krishna says karma yoga and karma sanyas or let me put first and not in the complexity he says both of them okay karma yoga and karma sanyas both of them are good nishreya sa kara ubhav both of them can take us towards our long term good but then he says that karma yoga is easier that if you just try to do takes renounce the world then it is much more difficult <coughs> let's look at one of the verses so the first point is both of them they have the common goal that both of them renouncing the world and engaging with the world now engaging the the world not for the purpose of enjoyment but for the purpose of service for the purpose of contribution 
that both can both have the same purpose as i krishna will say that those who think they are different they are like children they are not very intelligent panditah the wise people don't differentiate now while both of them have the same purpose the process itself is different and krishna says that in their process one is easier see he will start this first he says sukham nirdvando hi mahabaho sukham bandhat kunche sukham is easily bandhat pramuchyate one will come out of bondage and that same theme he will illustrate again in the last verse so let in the last verse in this particular direct answer to his question so let's look at this sanyasas tu mahabaho sanyas is renouncing work oh, oh mighty arm arjuna you are very powerful you are capable of taking sanyas also but certainly what is the what happens in sanyas dukham aptum ayogataha ayogataha if you are not engaged in you engaging in yoga then it is troublesome dukham aptum sanyasas tu mahabaho sanyasas tu mahabaho dukham aptum ayogataha dukham aptum ayogataha then in contrast yoga yukto if somebody is engaged in yoga munir brahma such a muni can attain brahma brahma is the ultimate reality na chiren na chiren means without much time adhigachati will attain that yoga yukto munir brahma yoga yukto munir brahma na chiren adhigachati na chiren adhigachati so now he is saying that if you are engaged in yoga then here is talking about yoga in terms of action with detachment basically karma yoga the principle can apply to bhakti yoga also but he is saying the na chire na adhigachati very easily you can attain liberation without much difficulty without much delay na chire na so generally speaking whenever we are pursuing a goal we are concerned about two things when there is pursuit of a goal we think about how much time how much effort isn't it that's what we normally think about if somebody says hey you know uh, you can get this degree after that you can get a very good job okay how much time is going to take okay two years one year three years four years 10 years oh that's too much and how much effort yeah, it's very easy to study it's very difficult to study so time and effort these are the two main considerations we have so basically time is associated with delay effort is associated with difficulty so how much delay how much difficulty so what krishna is saying in the in this in this verse 5.6 he is saying that sanyas involves difficulty hmm? whereas karma yoga involves no delay no chire no there is much difficulty and no delay on the other side now here there is one important point to clarify that the word sanyas itself has many different meanings now we may say what is the, what can the different meanings of sanyas what does sanyas literally mean as we know only renunciation renunciation that's true but renunciation itself can be in different ways so there can be the renunciation that is involved in gyan yoga or dhyan yoga and there is the renunciation in bhakti yoga now there is a big difference so i will talk more about this when we come to the bhakti yoga section in the bhagavad gita but here it's important to contrast see when we are talking about renunciation arjuna is talking about renunciation primarily in terms of action the sanyasis traditional in gyan yoga dhyan yoga they don't do any activity sanyas is just generally considered to be inactive now in bhakti yoga san, when sanyas is taken when it is brahmacharya or sanyas renunciation is taken that renunciation the devotional renunciation is actually quite different from the renunciation that the bhagavad gita is talking about or the bhagavad gita is saying that is difficult 
because even in devotional renunciation for us renunciation is not the important thing the connection with krishna is the important thing and we renounce so that we can serve krishna better so the key point over here is in giving up activity activity no activity or activity so now in bhakti or renunciation there is activity isn't it in gyan yoga dhyan yoga there is no activity so so renunciation can be of different types when krishna is discussing with arjuna arjuna is talking about the renunciation by which he will give up the world and go to the forest and sit down in solitary meditation and that is the typical renunciation that is in his mind at this particular time so krishna arjuna is saying this is difficult why is it difficult because the soul by nature is active and because the soul by nature is active inactivity is unnatural for the soul now of course sometimes it is possible that if a person is running around too much just sit down be peaceful that is good but if we consider from a logical perspective the god has not given us ability so that we give up the abilities isn't it god has not given us the power to be active so that we give up the power to be active god has not given us the power of speaking so that we give up the power of speaking so that would not make any sense why would god give us any abilities the point is that activity the power to do activity is a gift and it needs to be constructively used rather than destructively used so the the bondage the bandhan karma bandhan that is caused the cause of bondage is not activity it is it is actually destructive or misdirected activity so activity done for one's own pleasure mm. especially pleasure that is disconnected from spiritual reality from krishna so it could be what activity ability all of these why would we be given those things so that we give those things up it just doesn't make sense so why god gives us things we have to give up so what we have to give up is not the things themselves such as the ability but the the misdirection the misuse of the things and then see, still arjuna is not very got, got very clearly at how is it that if somebody is acting they will not be entangled action will entangle and if somebody is inactive then they are not going to get entangled so krishna is saying it's not that simple and that is what we will discuss today and here this whole section which starts next it's called in philosophy there's a word etiology etiology is basically the study of causation now it's like explaining with our one word with another word that links links the explanation <laughs> but causation means the link between cause and effect the cause effect connection so what cause leads to what what effect have any of you heard the word etiology before okay yeah so in the pandemic the word etiology started coming in the news because etiology is also used in medical science to talk of the etiology of a disease how does the disease begin how does the disease spread so it can refer in the medical sense but also in philosophical sense how does cause lead to effect that study so krishna is going to talk about this now to help arjuna understand how if one is detached one will not be bound so there are many verses in the section and they are a bit philosophical but we will focus on one verse and we'll try to understand the underlying concept so let's look at the verse and then we will 
discuss the concept. So, Krishna says over here that when we act, Sarva Karmani Manasa, with all the action that you do with the mind, Sanyas Asti. That Sanyasi means you give up, re renounce mentally the action that we do. Aste, if you can do that, Sukham Vashi. Such a person can be happy situated. Vashi means to stay. Sarva Karmani Manasa. Sarva Karmani Manasa. Sanyas Aste Sukham Vashi. Sanyas Aste Sukham Vashi. And where does the person reside? Navadware Pure Dehi. That this body is like a city of nine gates. Which are the gates? Yeah, the two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth, and the two reproductive organs. So, Krishna is talking here about, he is giving the metaphor, the body like a city. In this, what? In this city, what happens? Naiva Kurvan. Not doing the karyan, not causing to do. Navadware Pure Dehi. Navadware Pure Dehi. Naiva Kurvan Nakarayan. Naiva Kurvan Nakarayan. So, let's recite it together once again. Sarva Karmani Manasa. Sanyasya Ste Sukham Vashi. Navadware Pure Dehi. Naiva Kurvan Nakarayan. So here, let's try to understand what it means when, whenever action occurs. So basically, Krishna is considering earlier, he uses the, the body can be considered to be like a machine. Now, here the metaphor is given about city and I'll come to that city. But the idea of a machine is that it acts automatically. The machine acts in its own way. So, when the machine is acting, it there is a mechanical aspect to its functioning and now the soul is conscious. When the soul acts, the soul chooses which of the mechanical functions of the body to go along with and which to not go along with. Say, if we consider our phone. Now, as soon as you start, start the phone, well, there will be many default programs that start. And some when they start, do you want to start this program? Yes, no. Now we can choose yes, we can choose no. So basically, what he is saying is that if we consider this is the soul and say this is the mind. Now, the mind is again thereafter linked with the body. And then the body is what is connected with the outer world. So now, in the, <coughs> in the mind, there are many impressions. Some of the impressions are impressive, others not so impressive. <laughs> so, these impressions, they can be broadly classified into two categories. Those are positive and those which are negative. Now, terms can vary, but the positive impressions are called instincts. The negative impressions are called impulses. So, impulses are the vague. The instincts are the vritti. See, the idea is that every one of us, when we function in life, there are certain things that just come naturally to us. So, let's first look at the positive because negative we often talk about it. Like, like naturally, some urges come upon us. When we see some delicious food, immediately the urge comes to eat it. So that is an impulse. So impulses are natural. So when I am using the word natural means what? 
they come without any conscious planning on our side this come automatically so these are at one sense natural but and we could say some of these are negative and these impulses can be stronger in some people weaker in some people in somebody who become addicted their impulses they are very strong so basically uh, the strength can vary but then along with that each one of us has certain instincts instincts means there are certain things which come up from inside which at which we are naturally good like some people so impulses could be say it they could be for eating they could be for drinking they could be for any kind of enjoying but instincts can also be for example some people are just good at language some people are good at music some people are good at decoration what that means is that some people you know just tell them you know i want to if we are trying to write a letter or we are trying to convey a message and you are struggling to get the right words you just ask them and they in 2 minutes they get the right thing or sometimes you have heard you you have noticed that sometimes in a meeting you know we want to say something and we are not able to say it and somebody else says that is hey, that's exactly what i wanted to say is it i just didn't get the words like some people have a way with words hmm? and for some people the words seem to be away <laughs> <laughs> they're here but they're just not here so some people have a natural language instinct Now some people may have a music instinct. They they just pick up an instrument and they start playing it and they start playing it so well. Mm-hmm. Some people when they start playing an instrument, you know, people just come to hear. Others when they play instrument, people go away as far as possible. <laughs> so different people have different instincts. Some people you just tell they they're staying in a home and some guest comes and they says, "Hey, you know, if you move this picture here, You move the sofa here. You just change this here. Put this flower vase here. It looks so beautiful. They stayed in their home for six months. They didn't think about it. This person comes within sixty seconds. They come up with the idea. So those are people who have the instinct for decorating. So now the instinct means again, it's not that they have to consciously plan. Now of course conscious planning can help, but it naturally comes up. So this these vrittis are associated with our varna. so varna means it is a occupational division when draupadi in the swayamvar was won over by an unknown brahmin at least from drupada's perspective so he wanted to know who are they really so he invited that that person along with his family to his home and his home was a palace and he seated them in a a room and he said we'll serve you food they invited them for lunch and he said i'll just come in a few minutes now in that house it is a long room on the opposite side on a table he had kept various items you know on one side he had kept some scriptures and some paraphernalia for doing yagya then next to it he had kept some weapons then next to it he had kept some plow and other things used for uh, for farming and then he had kept some artisan tools and he from a concealed window he and his son drishtadyumna started watching and the pandava sat down now they sat down they looked around and they looked at the table and all of them got up and straight all of them walked to toward the weapons and arjuna picked up a bow and started feeling with his arms and say hey, this is a good bow you know it's similar to that bow and bhima picked up a bass and started swinging it around <laughs> and within just a few minutes they were deep in conversation and seeing that drupada and drishtadyumna started smiling they are not brahmanas they are kshatriyas <laughs> so basically our varna or our varna is associated with our innate vritti vritti means we have instincts natural instincts so what we can say is the way to know our varna how do we know we note consciously 
what we notice automatically what we notice automatically there will be a hundred things in a room what where does our attention naturally go to automatically unthinkingly go to now it can go towards sense objects that's one thing <laughs> that's due to our attachments but you know even materialistic people in one sense they know that nobody can enjoy sense gratification 24 hours a day the body just does not have the capacity so apart from that everybody has their interests so what are those interests those are indicative of our vritti those, those are our instincts and we all are meant to use these instincts for serving appropriately now tradition is four varanas we are talking about now the varana division may not be the most helpful in today's world because in the occupations of today are not necessarily neatly dividable into the varanas of the past say now today somebody is a teacher because the teacher is a brahmana well yes but then you know if you are a faculty one of the main things you have to do is research and for that research you have to get grants and getting grants means you have to worry about money a good amount of thing you have to worry so that is quite a bit of a vaishya activity so today's professional roles it's not so very easy to categorize among traditional varanas so the point is that we may look at our instincts in different ways now, now psychologists talk about different kinds of intelligence there's linguistic intelligence mathematical intelligence there's spatial visual intelligence logical intelligence intrapersonal intelligence you may have heard about these different kinds of intelligences so the point is what are the things that we are naturally attracted to those are our instincts so now krishna says in this particular section he's elaborating that within just like in the city there are if we consider the city has nine gates so many citizens will come out so many vehicles may come in and so many vehicles may go out now we don't really get worked up about which vehicle every vehicle that comes in every vehicle that goes out there's a lot happening and let it happen now we focus on what is relevant for us so in the body lots of things are happening so right now for example you are hearing my speech but you may be hearing the sound of the fan also if your stomach is hungry you may be hearing the rumbling of your stomach also <laughs> so at any moment many many sensations are coming in through our senses so we we focus on what matters to us so when we see the world we rarely see the world as it is because it can be too overwhelming there is so much information to take in we see the world as it matters to us that is that is functional that is functionally effect, useful for us so for example if you come uh, to this room maybe in the first time you are visiting here and you know there is a class over here now you could look at various things ok what is the color of the wall how many lights are there over here you now what is the kind of decoration over here now there are so many details you could look at but maybe if your concern is hey, I feel a little hot so I want to be somewhere near the fans ok there is the AC I want to sit near the AC or say you are very interested in subject so where can I sit so that I can most attentively hear the class or maybe you are feeling tired and you may want to doze off a little bit so you may think okay where can I sit so that I won't know nobody will notice me if I doze off <laughs> is it <laughs> so the idea is that we don't see the world as it is it's just too overwhelming too complex we see the world as it matters to us now what matters depends on our desires so broadly in you know, our desire k 
can be for gratification for enjoyment or the desire can be for purification so those who whose primary driving desire is gratification then they will focus on what can provide them gratification those whose primary driving desire is purification then they will focus on what will purify them so krishna says that again going back to this particular diagram now there is a soul over here next to that is the mind now in the mind there are impressions so we could say there are impulses and there are instincts now the impulses we need to say no to them and the instincts we say yes to them. now yes for what so that we can use them in service we can use them for purification so when the soul observes the mind say if i am observing my phone now maybe there are 10 uh, social media apps on my phone and all of them are giving notifications now some of them may not be relevant for me. say if i am doing some service and i know that i am expecting a message say i am expecting a message on whatsapp or on facebook then that particular social media app is relevant for me so i focus on that and i neglect the other so on the other hand i just want to kill time you know i'm just bored you know, people who can't facebooks seek shelter in facebook <laughs> so, so uh, we are just looking for some entertainment. Then we may look at apps. Okay, where some nice video might come, where some titillation might come. So, what happens there is, depending on our, depending on our desire, we will choose which of the things coming on our phone we say yes to and which we say no to. So now. krishna is saying that when we act for purification when we are acting not for gratification but for purification then even when we are acting we will not get entangled we may act but we will not get entangled why because we are using the body for functional purposes we are using the mind for functional purposes we are not using it for sensual purposes so instincts can be used for functional for functioning in the world we need it impulses they are for sensual purposes we want to enjoy the senses so for us uh, as seekers on the spiritual path krishna till now has not talked about bhakti he will start talking about it in the sixth chapter till now he is talking primarily about uh, the process of karma yoga so the idea of acting with detachment So now what happens is in karma yoga in any path of yoga whether it is we can just call it action yoga action yoga can be karma yoga or it can be bhakti yoga in this what happens is we say yes to instincts and we say no to impulses but in gyan yoga dhyan yoga what happens is we have to say no to instincts and no to impulses everything and that is eventually suffocating if everything that comes from within us just have to say no 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 it's like any relationship if we are making some request to someone that person says no 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 <laughs> then we will eventually say no to the relationship only is it enough i don't want to be involved in this so that's why he says dukham aaptum ayogata ha if we have to keep saying no constantly to our mind then it's not going to be easy we do have to say no to our mind but there's a difference between sometimes or even many times saying no to the mind and saying no all the times to the mind so see there is a difference between regulation is not the same as repression 
regulation is um, is more like sometimes no repression is always no so earlier also krishna has said in third chapter that nigraha kim karish see what can repression accomplish so regulation is required now regulation means that we say yes to our instincts and we say no to our impulses now of course some impulses may be very strong so we may not be able to say no completely to them then we regulate them so but again there is some regulation so regulation is not repression repression is very difficult regulation on the other hand is very much possible so with this understanding krishna says that now when we move forward we will focus on one key verse and here we will discuss something more about a theme which we started discussing in third chapter and if you know this verse so what does it mean ye hi this indeed samsparsha ja bhoga samsparsha sparsha is contact ja bhoga the bhoga that comes from it the pleasure that comes from it what happens dukha yonaya evate says that this pleasure itself is the cause of suffering yoni means like a womb from it distress will come so yehi samsparsha ja bhoga yehi samsparsha ja bhoga dukha yonaya evate dukha yonaya evate why is it dukha at one level adi antavantah it begins and then soon it ends antavantah kaute o arjuna and therefore nateshu in that ramate ramate means to delight to take pleasure budha the wise do not delight in it adyantavantah kaunteya adyantavantah kaunteya nateshu ramate budha nateshu ramate budha okay so let's look at this now so this is a poetic rendition of the verse was when a sense contacts a sense object there comes a pleasure to which the wise object na te shuramate they are not interested in that pleasure such a such pleasure is frustratingly fleeting now it is beginning and now ending if our mind creates a huge fantasy about how the pleasure is how wonderful the pleasure is but what happens is the fantasies that people have for hours days weeks years the actual pleasure just ends within moments and we can try to extend it but the pleasure itself it is it is very limited and that's why in one sense even if there is no external consequence imagine that after getting sense pleasure there is no trouble that comes up there is in sense pleasure there is some extrinsic trouble that means something which comes as a consequence but in sense pleasure there is also intrinsic trouble the intrinsic trouble is that there is so much craving for so long and after that the the pleasure that comes it lasts for such a little time so it is frustratingly fleeting mm. so for something that's so little why or oh why do we crave so much ready to lose dignity and morality for just a touch such indeed is the scary power of the world's illusion that entices and entraps us with many a temptation that there are not just one or two there are many many temptations and while temptations have always been there in the material world so technology has made the temptations even more and more easily accessible just so like 
the mind wants to look at sensual things. But today with technology, in five minutes, a person can access more sensual imagery than even 50 years ago, a person could access in 50 years of their entire lifetime. So in one sense, we are in a very vulnerable position. Uh, there are many sociologists who are saying that you know, our technology has become too strong for our morality. We humans have some moral muscles by which we can say no to things. Like everybody has muscles by which you can lift some weight. But say, if somebody puts 500 kg weight on my head, it's going to be very difficult for me to lift it. So, for, for the problem is, the, again, technology is not to be blamed. Technology can be used for good or for bad. But the one result of technology is that temptation has become so easily available. That, is it that our technology has become too strong for our morality? So, it, it is not just with respect to sexual pleasure, it is with any kind of pleasure. You know, somebody wants to gamble. In the past, they would have to go to a gambling den. Now, the gambling den is right in your phone. Isn't it? And not just one, there are many gambling dens you can say. There are many apps for gambling. So, we are all in a very vulnerable position. And recognizing that is very important. See, if we don't understand the danger that we are in, then we won't protect ourselves. So what has happened is, has our technology become too strong for our morality? This is the question. So because of this, we are very vulnerable. Hmm? Say very vulnerable means what? Say, if say there are, there are tensions between say India and Pakistan. Now, Pakistan can attack India anywhere. but if some person is living right on the border, then they have to be more careful because they are more vulnerable. So like that, temptation has always been there throughout history. But now, it is available much, much more. So, that is a challenge. Even with this with drug addiction, the drugs have always been there. They like something like cocaine and heroin and these things. They, you could say to some extent, they grow naturally. That's a question about that. But you can say some, some, to some extent, some drugs go naturally. But many of the drugs that are, that are widely taken now, now, these are drugs which are made chemically to have maximum addictiveness. And it's, you just take it and then, the, the, it's so gripping, it's so overwhelming, that it's very, very difficult to give it up. So, this applies even to foods like uh, many of the food items. They are, there, is, see, there is natural sweet taste is there in nature. The mango is sweet, sugar cane is sweet. So there is something which is natural sweetness. But what happens nowadays when say chocolates and stuff like that is made, the sweetness is increased to the level where addictiveness is quite natural to it. So we are, we are at one level when we are trying to, see, if, if we are to fight temptation, fighting temptation, there is an external fight and there is an internal fight. The external fight is against the objects. The internal fight is against the impressions, specifically the impulses. So now, the ultimate solution, we cannot free the world from the tempting objects. That is there. So ultimate solution is to, is to purify ourselves of the unhealthy impulses. But the impulses can be very rapidly triggered by if the objects are either too easily available or they are too temptingly presented. So, either, either way, there can be the objects, what has happened? The access is increased, the appeal is increased. So, access and appeal, when both are increased, it's a deadly problem. See, many people who look, 
extremely attractive. So it's like there is, if you meet them in real life, yeah, they may be attractive, but they're not all that attractive. Like their photos or their videos, there's like a, there is first, when before they take a photo, there is a physical makeup. And after they take a photo, there's a digital makeup. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is, the appeal, there is like a makeup squared. <laughs> physical and digital. So, so it's just over when we was in America, there was one boy, his uh, t-shirt, that is had a slogan or a quote. He said, 90% of the world's women are beautiful. The remaining 10% are in my college. <laughs> <laughs> so, what he meant by that is, that when we see on TV, when we see on social media, people appear so attractive. <laughs> and the people who we meet in real life, <laughs> they just don't seem to be that attractive. <laughs> so, so this is, so when the axis and the appeal, uh, that is artificially increased or unnaturally increased, then what happens is, the external triggers to our impulses become much more. And then, we become much, much more vulnerable. So, to some extent, like we talked earlier, we have to create a safe zone, by which we are not exposed to the triggers. So, but we cannot always stay in that safe zone. We have to come out of the safe zone. Say, we may say that, okay, when we are in the morning program, the voice, our mind is so peaceful. Yeah, yes, but we all have to engage with the world. You know, we have to do various, we have our uh, career, we have studies, even if we have all our particular services. So, uh, we need the safe zone for some time. But eventually, it is the impulses that are inside us that need to be weakened, that need to be overcome. So, Let's go back. So this, this whole thing, Nateshu Ramate Buddha. How can we come to that level where Buddha, we can become wise enough so that we don't indulge in these pleasures. Now, one important thing over here, the next words itself, Krishna will say that, let's look at this verse. Shak shaknoti. Shaknoti means, this is possible for you. Ihaiva Yaha Sodum. Here in this world, Yaha is this particular urge. Sodum. Sodum is to tolerate. If it is possible for you to tolerate. Shakno Tihaiva Yaha Sodum. Shakno Tihaiva Yaha Sodum. Prak Shari Vimokshana. Till, the, as long as we have the body, till we have not become free from the body. Prak Shari Vimokshana. Prak Shari Vimokshana. Uh, so, what do we have to tolerate here? That is Kama Krodho Bhavam Vegam. So, Vega is the urges, the impulses. They can come from Kama, they, they can be desire, and when desire, there is some obstruction to fulfilling it, then that is Krodha. Kama Krodho Bhavam Vegam. Kama Krodho Bhavam Vegam. Sa Yuktaha. Such a person is well connected. Such a person can be engaged in yoga. And paradoxically, Krishna says, Sa Sukhi Naraha. Such a person will be happy. So we'll discuss how that happiness comes. But Sa Yuktaha Sa Sukhi Naraha. Sa Yukta Sa Sukhi Naraha. So now here is an important point that Krishna is saying that just by our being in a body, just by our biological condition, certain <coughs> thoughts, certain desires, certain urges may automatically pop up. So, it's important that while, while protecting ourselves from temptation, we don't beat ourselves down with guilt. I'll explain what I mean by this. See, there is Whenever there is, uh, you could say, material activity, 
specifically sense pleasure or sense engagement let's put it if you're a neutral word right now so there is there is three levels there is biology the biological aspect to it there is a psychological aspect to it and beyond that there is an intentional aspect to it what do i mean by this see if we see some delicious food naturally our tongue might salivate it now that is simply biology now in some special cases for some great soul that may not happen but that's just biology mm -hmm. and that biology is itself not a bad thing mm -hmm. that biology is actually required so that when when saliva is secreted then when we get food then the pre digestion of the food starts in the tongue itself mm -hmm. it's with saliva it's because of the saliva also that we are able to taste the food so and saliva itself is not a bad thing mm -hmm. so that is there is a biological component to it so similarly there is a biological component that say whenever a male sees a female or a female sees a male there is going to be natural attraction over there <coughs> that's just a biological aspect to it now similarly at a psychological level based on the kind of conditionings that we have from the past mm -hmm. certain desires certain thoughts certain ideas may naturally pop up mm -hmm. so now what happens involuntarily so you could say these two can be involuntary This is what 5.23 is saying. That they will happen. Prak sharir vimokshana. Just by being in the body, these will happen. I mean, there is that famous prayer of uh, Yamuna Charya, when he says that, "Ya Daudi Ma," uh, that whenever I think of sex desire, my lips curl in distaste. You know that shloka? You have heard of that words? And Yamuna Charya is a great acharya. He says that when I, ever since I have been started relishing the remembrance of Krishna. after that if ever the thought of uh, enjoying with the woman comes or engaging with the woman enjoying with them comes he says my lips curl in distaste and i spit at the thought now we often focus on that point and that it is a very it's a sign of great detachment that you can he feels he feels no appeal for that pleasure but you could look at it from another way that even when somebody is relishing the remembrance of krishna still that thought may come mm -hmm. so now of course it's possible that somebody may so be so pure that no such thought come it's entirely possible that yamuna charya is just saying this at the level of sadhaka to guide us how we should respond but the point is that there is a biological aspect to this and when a particular desire so a particular sensation comes in the body a particular desire comes in the mind a particular emotion rises these could just be involuntary now what is intentional that is voluntary that is voluntary means that is what in our control so for example what may be in our control is contemplation contemplation so krishna doesn't say drushyato vishayan pumsah that doesn't lead to fall what is the fall is dhayato vishayan pumsa perception is something which we can't avoid we can't go around with the world with closed eyes mm -hmm. see there is there's glancing and there is staring <laughs> is it it and of course the essential point of word is ogling so the point is that dhayato is where one is just is contemplating now contemplating is not automatic that is intentional a thought might pop up but then we let ourselves dwell on it then we get carried away by it that is when it gets power that is when it starts carrying us away so contemplation is intentional and of course then after contemplating we start chasing it the chase the pursuit of it that is of course intentional okay you know i can go there and get this if i do this then then you know maybe i can do this and nobody will find out about it mm -hmm. so that kind of chase that's intention 
so when we are we are trying for say sense regulation that means we are trying for some level of self control or discipline so there are two unhealthy responses one is just indulgence just indulge and versus if that indulgence is with nonchalance nonchalance means everybody is doing it what is the big deal i don't make a big thing about it if you nonchalant that's going to be a big problem like somebody says somebody says while drinking it is just one drink well the problem is the one drink doesn't stay one drink is <laughs> the first the drinker takes the drink then the drink takes the drink and then the drink takes the drinker <laughs> <laughs> so it keeps growing each time we indulge what happens is the impulses will grow and then initially the impulse may be resistible but if it keeps growing it can become almost irresistible so being nonchalant oh it's no big deal everybody does it that's not a that's not a very healthy way of looking at it we will get ourselves into trouble but at the same time going to, when we are trying to discipline ourselves if we go to as guilt at just the occurrence occurrence of the thought that is also unhealthy the thoughts desires they will pop up because there is a certain automatic or biological or psych automatic biological or psycho psychological aspect to it so the key thing is that it will pop up but we can choose whether to say yes or no but if we start feeling guilty just because the desire has come up then yeah we can be aware if the desire pops up that means okay i still have this conditioning this conditioning has not gone away i have not become purified but just something popping up we can't live forever burdened or crippled by guilt if if we if we if this will if we do this is what will it will be crippling we will not be able to function at all so we need to make sure that we understand the nature of how our body mind machine works so going back to the uh, previous exam now you remember we talked about bollywood and bhagavad gita so if somebody doesn't want to go to bollywood.com but they type b and bollywood.com comes as auto complete in their browser and they start feeling guilty about that well it is a good reminder that that's where i was going before but there's no need for guilt about it so guilt can very easily become unhealthy now of course not having guilt is also unhealthy because the guilt is immense it's meant to be a protector just like pain at a physical level is a protector when i go to go too close to fire i feel pain i feel a burning sensation and that pain is meant to be a protector that pain tells me don't go closer to the fire so like that guilt is meant to protect us whenever we are doing something that is wrong then guilt tells us that hey don't go there but if somebody is feeling pain for no reason then that means something is intrinsically wrong with their body and they need some other kind of treatment of it so pain when we are near some danger that pain is good but pain when there is no danger that is bad that indicates something is more fundamentally wrong so pain like guilt it is meant to be a protector pain is more of a physical protector guilt is more of a psychological protector so pain protects at the level of sensations sensation is physical hmm? sensation has got nothing to do with sensational sensations is what is pursued with the senses guilt is guilt protects at the level of emotions we feel bad so now in between these two what is there one side is indulgence the other side 
is guilt too much guilt is bad too much indulgence definitely it's bad so how do we go about regulation you remember the two steps we talked about earlier sorry boundaries and higher taste yes that same thing can be uh, it can be put in a different way over here krishna will talk about in the next six chapter we'll talk about abhyas and vairagya hmm? so abhyas and vairagya that can be phrased as abstinence you have heard this word abstinence abstain abstain means to say no hmm? abstinence and diligence so diligence means to say yes consistently so abstinence is abhyas and diligence is vairagya is that correct no it's the opposite okay so abstinence is vairagya so that means the urge pops up within you come on eat this watch this touch this buy this no just because the urge is popped up doesn't mean i have to do it abstinence and then uh, uh, diligence is abhyas what do i want to do let me focus on doing that so like if a person visits bhagavadgita.com again and again and again naturally what will happen that will come as auto completed vision so so basically abstinence and diligence mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or if diligence is an unfamiliar word you can use the word persistence how many of you know the word persistence okay how many of you know the word diligence or knew it before i spoke it okay some of you so you could use it persistence so now this combination of abstinence and persistence that will take us towards eventually transcendence so this is if you see a pt it is an apt method for purification the purification how will it happen purification means we abstain we persist and gradually we will transcend now transcend means what transcend means that the desire itself no longer comes that say if somebody has visited bhagavad visited bhagavadgita.com so many times that now that alone comes as auto complete that bollywood.com doesn't come on and even if somebody is visit else is visiting bollywood.com still i'm not interested so that is transcend so now during this period when there is abstinence and there is persistence so these words might seem abstinence is a familiar word for you if you want to use a easier word more familiar word can't have the acronym with it but still there is tolerance see when we use the word tolerance what it means is essentially accept presence but don't accept influence like when we say we are tolerating someone what does that mean you know you would much rather that person not be there but if that person is there then okay uh, let that person be there but i won't let that person get to my nerves i won't let that person irritate me i won't let that person make me angry so we accept so similarly within us these urges will pop up and we need to accept their presence but we don't accept their influence influence means they're saying okay come on i say eat this do this watch this these are coming this will come they will go so going back to the earlier metaphor of the which we discussed the city in the city some people who have come may come who are unwanted now they will come you know if we start talking with them we start arguing with them we start attacking them they will start talking with us they will start arguing with us they will start attacking us and then it will grow but if we continue doing our business they will come they will go so like that the urges they will come they will stay for some time and they will go so i'll talk two more points about 
one is about tolerance and the other is about persistence now the there is a key for being able to tolerate what is that that have any of you played this uh, what do you call this game wrestling arm wrestling is that what they call it panjala dana arm wrestling so now imagine if you are playing arm wrestling and say the person opposite to you is very powerful now sometime you know we are doing our best and the person is forcing our arm down forcing our arm down forcing our arm down and then the more our arm starts going down we start thinking what is the use you know anyway i'm going to be defeated <laughs> so uh, many times if you see in these arm wrestling matches that the first going down it is it is slower but when it ends towards the end it becomes fast it becomes fast not just because the other person suddenly becomes stronger because this person gives up so we could say that we all have to do arm wrestling with temptation and sometimes arm wrestling temptation can seem to be much much stronger than us but the trick is when when with temptation it is a arm wrestling match and it is possible that temptation is much stronger than us but the key is that it is a timed arm wrestling match say so it's like say that that person has to defeat within 3 minutes and you just hold out hold out for 3 minutes then we say okay next round is going to start again yeah but the next round is not going to start from there the next round is going to start back from here isn't it so the key is sometimes we think that the urge is coming i'm i'm saying no 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 but it's simply growing 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 how long can i keep saying no and then the pressure starts feeling too much so let me just give up but the fact is that it's not that it's it that's a, that's an illusion it will grow 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 but it will not keep growing permanently after some time it will itself weaken so we could say when craving comes or when the urge comes the urges that we have it's like they have phases when they are severe but it's not that they are constantly at that level so the urges have surges <laughs> so actually when the surges are there it's like you know the other person is very strong and our hand is almost gone to the ground but the surges don't last for very long so actually the tolerance that we need is only for this period or rather it is for this period we need high tolerance other times the tolerance that we need is not that much and sometimes the desire might just be like a background noise but sometimes it becomes like a foreground scream can't do it now but it doesn't stay like that for very long so at this stage it's like a dull background noise it is there like this this phone this fans noise is there it is there it is not that we are free from desire but it is not troubling us it is not tormenting us at this time but it is in this phase of urges it becomes a severe scream it feels as if it just can't be neglected i have to do it but tolerance has to be only for that period and if we can tolerate for that period then we will find that after that it decreases and over a period of time what will happen is the surges themselves will also start going down the surges so it is like in in this period what we need is abstinence or tolerance but this alone is not enough what is equally if not more important is 
in the in between periods that is persistence or diligence that sometimes when we are trying to fight against temptation and then we fail and we fail and we become so discouraged that we think what is the use of fighting i can never win and then we give up the fight against temptation and we give up even trying to become pure trying to become krishna conscious now if you consider in krishna consciousness in krishna consciousness you could say renunciation renunciation or be free from desire that is a part but that is only one part a person who is who is not been able to give a particular desire can they still practice bhakti yes anyone can practice bhakti even somebody who is breaking the four regular principles they can also practice bhakti yes they may not be at a particular standard where they can get initiated but sometimes what happens is that we reduce we start reducing krishna consciousness to we start equating it with renunciation that is krishna consciousness and renunciation we starting in both are the same thing and if i can't renounce this then i can't be krishna conscious then why try to be krishna conscious also? so we give up even when we don't have to give up. maybe when the surges happen we are not able to resist but does that mean at remaining times we can't do anything no we can so when the period in the period when the surges are not so the urges are not having the surges at that time if we are engaged in constructive activity if we are engaged in trying to serve krishna if we are engaged in doing things that are meaningful that are valuable for us that are uplifting for us then what will happen is that will itself start strengthening us like like in between the two rounds like that time in the arm wrestling match i just have to somehow or the other hold on but suppose i don't and then in between uh, you know i or the you i can never win just give up but maybe in between the break maybe you take some energy drink to strengthen yourself maybe if the match is next day you practice some must uh, do some exercise and strengthen yourself so in between we can be strengthening ourselves but if we equate renunciation with krishna consciousness then we just give up yo has any of you heard this statement hmm? i am a fallen soul now what happens many times the fallen become so big that we forget the soul that means we start thinking i am fallen well we need to remember that fallen is also a temporary designation <laughs> just as we say that okay that i am indian i am an engineer i am male i am i am young i am middle aged these are temporary designations and we should not identify too much with them. similarly our identification with our fallen state we may be fallen but that should not be so much that we forget that we are souls that we start thinking i am so fallen that the krishna consciousness will not work for me this bhakti is not for me no we may be fallen but we are still souls and krishna loves every soul so we need to focus on connecting with krishna and that connection with krishna is what i'll start from the seventh chapter much more but the key point over here is that if we focus in the next verse what krishna says is that how do you learn to tolerate by turning towards inner pleasure yo antah sukho antararam satantar jyoti reyo so yogi brahma nirvanam brahma bhuto digachati so the more we focus on connecting with krishna the more we will find that we will become stronger so this last image it will control say if i am here and say krishna is here hmm? and then 
sense objects are here now guilt should come in between me and the sense objects such guilt is guilt that stops me from analyzing sense objects is good but sometimes what happens is that guilt comes over here so this we should see this is pseudo guilt this is not actually guilt this is maya coming in the form of guilt so what happens is first the first the impulses from within the mind they say come on do it do it do it do it enjoy 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 and then after we enjoy then the same mind says you fool why did you enjoy don't you have any intelligence you idiot when will you learn so that same thing same mind which first keeps us away from krishna by dragging us towards maya and afterwards it same mind or at least the impressions within the mind the negative impressions the impulses within the mind what they do is afterwards they say why did you go there so we have to recognize that this this dark voice within the mind so we both of these sorry i'm not here it's like mm, the same mm, the negative impressions within the mind first they will give us surges of desire and then they will give us surges of guilt and if the guilt becomes too much then it's a problem it's like say suppose we are just going about our normal life and a friend comes and says hey do you want to make money quickly okay i'm interested let's rob a bank together <laughs> yeah get lost i don't know i want to now come on let's do it you know i got a foolproof plan will not be caught and then somehow we go along and then we go there and we go to rob the bank and suddenly an alarm rings and our friend runs away <laughs> and then we are caught we are arrested and then we are taken to the court and in the court the attorney who is going to persecute us that is the same friend <laughs> <laughs> you rascal first you got me to rob and now you are going to put me in jail for robbing so that is how this dangerous double role of the negative impression in the mind comes first makes us say you do this terrible thing and what a fool you are you do such a terrible thing now should we feel bad after we do something terrible yes of course but that feeling bad should not make us so discouraged that we give up our krishna bhakti rather okay why did i do this because i turned away from krishna because i let go of my grip on krishna so let me hold on to krishna if i hold on to krishna then i will be able to overcome this so that's why it's very important surges of desire is like friend let's rob a bank and that same friend hmm, you are a criminal whom i will punish now so the mind beating us up it's the same mind beating us up first with desire and second time with guilt that's why while guilt is good if we have to see falena parichayate what is the result of the guilt is that guilt keeping us away from maya or is that guilt keeping us away from krishna if it's keeping us away from krishna it is making us discouraged in bhakti but then just reject that guilt this is coming from maya i will focus on connecting with krishna so let's look at this this reflection and conclude it so that entices and entraps us with many a temptation talk about entices that access and appeal increases oh lord i beg you for mercy to have the vision to see the reality beyond the delusion there is systematic illusion is just illusion the illusion like a systematic illusion reality of not just the pleasure that takes us nowhere save the grave that means this pleasure will end in death punarapi jannam punarapi maranam 
reality also of your unfailing love the goal of those who are great those who are sober those who are buddha they understand krishna's love is ultimate reality grant me o lord the abiding conviction that your words are the path to satisfaction so what i we will talk about is more in the seventh chapter when we come to it that krishna says when you regulate yourself sa, sa yukta sa sukhi how do you become happy because when we become connected with krishna that connection itself will gradually bring us happiness grant me o lord the enriching connection that will help make your will my life's mission the connection is not just in remembering the lord it's also serving the lord it's remembering the lord's instructions and making that our life's will grant me o lord the uplifting compassion that will help me help those without your devotion so please o lord become my life's locus locus is the center point and empower my heart to focus this is a last point this plan this is inspired from prahlad maharaj's words that on what people are missing when they are turned to the world away from you and not on what my mind is missing when i am turned away from the world to you see what happens is i don't know. see sometimes when there are great soul prahlad maharaj says oh materialistic people you know they are carrying such a burden of maya and they are suffering and i am enjoying mahamrutam magna chitta there is so much joy in krishna consciousness and there is so little pleasure and so much trouble in sense gratification so they are missing this so much nectar i want to give them this nectar so that is the vision of a great devotee but sometimes our vision is what oh there is so much nectar over there and i am missing that <laughs> so actually not i it's our conditioned mind which feels oh they are enjoying so much and i am missing i am following so many rules i am doing this i am doing that i am missing that actually what we are missing is very very little but our mind imagines as if it is too much so just to illustrate this how it works is if say if i am here we see krishna consciousness to be the source of happiness and sense enjoyment to be a time less pleasure in but it is tiny this is the vision of the seers the great souls but the vision of those who are not seers those who are neophytes what it appears as if is krishna consciousness is tiny and sense enjoyment is so big this is what it seems to us but this is the illusion of the mind so if we keep hearing regularly if then we will we will be able to see beyond the appearance oh sense enjoyment is not all that big that it seems to be it may be its pleasure is there but it's just tiny and krishna consciousness is like anandam buddhi vardhanam it is a ocean and it's an expanding ocean so when we have this conviction then we are often driven by what we think we are missing if i think i am missing sense pleasure you know i always be looking for sense pleasure looking for every opportunity but if you realize that actually i am missing the eternal ecstatic joy that is there in my relationship with krishna that is my birthright as a soul who is a part of krishna that is the gift that the great acharyas have come to bestow in my life and why should i continue this <coughs> so that is a prayer my lord let me focus on what others are missing when they are turned away from you towards the world not what i am missing what we are missing is very little what others are missing is very much so i'll summarize what we discussed today the last verse of this chapter says that if we truly understand krishna as the enjoyer as the proprietor as the well wisher then we will get peace that means we will understand krishna is the source of oceanic happiness and then we will no longer crave for the pleasures of this world that's how we become peaceful so we discussed today about the first was karma yoga versus gyan yoga krishna says both of them 
karma yoga and jnana yoga both of them are meant to elevate but among the two which karma yoga is better than jnana yoga why because activity is natural for us and god has not given us the power to act, to be active power of activity or ability to give it up we are meant to use it so inactivity is unnatural and therefore the path that depends on inactivity <coughs> inactivity that's why means jnana yoga dhyan yoga the path of renunciation that makes it difficult so we discuss, discuss two things there is difficulty and there is delay both of them are a problem then we discussed about um, how to what working with detachment means how does working with detachment liberate i also talked here about how krishna the same question how he answers from a different perspective you could either just repeat or insult but better is to have a new perspective so the new perspective that krishna offers is based on etiology how actions happen how causes lead to effects so the point is that what is the cause and the effect we are talking about over here inside our mind there are impressions these impressions are of two kinds what are the two kinds instincts and impulses so instincts are broadly positive so instincts we want to say yes and we use these for purification and impulses we say no so basically here we learn to bring about regulation so we discuss the difference between regulation is not the same as repression repression is like saying no to everything that is unbearable that is unsustainable then we discussed about how when we are trying to do sense regulation so what are the what are the steps in that sense regulation that when we have the urges the urges have three aspects to it there is a biological aspect then there is a psychological aspect and then there is a intentional aspect so these biological cycle then they might automatically come so this is where we need tolerance is except that it will come tolerance means we accept presence but not the influence so we don't uh, let ourselves be driven by guilt intentional is what is in our control we we so what is intentional is for example contemplating or chasing that is something which we want to avoid now with by dealing with urges we discussed these two key steps that rather the fourth we discussed an acronym a p and t a was abstinence. abstinence then there is persistence and that will take us towards Trans transcendence so i discussed basically how the when the urges come they have intermittent surges so what we want to do is during this phase we want abstinence and during this phase we want persistence the phase when the urges are not too strong now when we are doing abstinence even if whether we succeed or not we talked about uh when we are trying for regulation there can be too little guilt then and there, if there is too little guilt nothing wrong with it then we'll get into big trouble but there is too much guilt and that will make us this will put us this will be this will put us in danger this will discourage us so in between is where guilt acts like a protector 
like pain acts as a protector guilt also acts as a protector so what we do is we want guilt to come between us and the sense objects not between us and krishna so guilt should be here and then we discuss how towards the end the example was of a timed arm wrestling match so we try to tolerate during the match and then we strengthen ourselves apart from the match and by that eventually we will become strong enough to win thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna any questions or comments yes please using uh, you told about instincts so my question is that instincts and gunas are the same thing or different we'll talk about the gunas later see from the it's a complicated the the guna instincts and impulses are present in our mind the gunas are not actually you could say they are influences that act on our mind the gunas are forces which are present more in nature that's one difference but let's talk we 14 chapter we want to discuss today evening are you going to be there in the evening today so we'll talk at that time about the modes thank you sir Today we see that uh, uh, after very, after very much deep thinking, uh, we commit our bad thing after very, very deep thinking. So it is after due deep to, thinking. Yeah. So it is due to impurity of soul, you know, coverage of the impurities on the over the soul. It's due to it, it never the soul is never impure. The soul is always a part of Krishna. The soul is always pure. It is due to the conditionings, the coverings on the soul. So basically. Sometimes the conditioning is maybe too strong. See, basically, whenever there is a relapse, you know the word relapse. Relapse means we do the same thing again. So relapse can broadly have three causes. One is external provocation was just too strong. Now, sometimes. we may be we may be uh, unwittingly exposed to that say for example when ajamil went out he did not go out looking for some sensual enjoyment he just went there and that sight was there it just overwhelmed him now for him it it was overwhelming Does that mean it has to be overwhelming for everyone it depends but sometimes the external provocation might be strong now maybe at that time the desire was so strong even when he came back the the image was replaying in his mind and he felt that he had to be with that that particular woman then he went and uh, was with her now all that you could say the urge is very strong but when he comes back home and then he decides to drive out his parents he decides to drive out his own chaste wife that cannot be blamed on the conditioning you know that's very much of a very intentional thing that he has done mm-hmm. so we'll talk about this probably maybe not in sixth chapter let's see when we can talk about it see basically when there is wrong doing <coughs> the wrong doing can be circumstantial mm-hmm. or it can be intentional so to some extent say we were decided i'm not going to eat sweets it's a simple example but then there's a feast and there are sweets and just everybody we offer somebody just take a little let me take hmm? and that's not a matter not, not a very big thing but just that circumstance but say somebody you know when everybody is sleeping we know where is mahaprasad you know where is the key to the mahaprasad locker we secretly wake up at night and go there and find that and take it now, is that circumstantial no that cannot be called circumstantial because that's intentional so there is a clear difference between just the situation comes up and overwhelms us so so now what happens sometimes when we relax it might be just because the external provocation is too strong so then if that is happening then we have to create boundaries so that next time at least i don't expose myself to that provocation again 
this is more of a circumstantial wrong way. Now sometimes it may be that the internal conditioning is too strong. Now if this is happening, then we need patience. That means the conditioning will change, but it may not happen immediately. So we need to be patient with our patient means that not that I just keep doing it, but don't beat ourselves up too much with pathological guilt. We, we keep trying to purify ourselves, but that like per abstinence and persistence, that abhyas and vairagya, that take time. So one understanding of that word vairagya, that vairagya is not just saying no to the temptation. That is true, but vairagya also means saying no to the temptation of our ego that I can be purified overnight. Now, our ego wants that, oh, I, yesterday I was a ninja, today I become pure devotee. It doesn't work like that. So, vairagya can also mean vairagya from the expectation of quick success. Things take time. Sometimes what may happen is, we may very well become, even if we became free from lust or greed or whatever, but if we became free too fast, it's quite likely we will become proud. And pride gives a different anartha which has its own problems. <laughs> so sometimes, we, when we don't become purified so quickly, gradually we start realizing that it's not happening because of my determination alone. It's actually happening by Krishna's mercy. And then we become more dependent on Krishna. And then, when we get purity, before purity we have got humility. If we get purity without humility, then that is a very straight recipe for pride. It is a straight path to pride. So patience. So in that time, so what happens is first we will get humility. <coughs> I need Krishna and then gradually you will get purity. That will happen. Hmm. Now the third possibility, this is where there is carelessness. Hmm. Carelessness, recklessness, you know, I don't care what happens. It could be that the carelessness could be in terms of um, we expose ourselves to tempt exposing ourselves to temptation we go into areas where suppose somebody is alcoholic and they are trying to recover from alcoholism hmm. and they say okay you know I now I have not drunk for one week I have become sober I just go out to hang out with my friends in a bar but I won't drink hmm. well you may decide that but someone else will decide something else for you because that conditioning is still there inside us. So sometimes we may put ourselves in provocative situation. That's because of we are exposing ourselves. And sometimes we just don't care about rules. There's a time when you know, I just want to enjoy, I don't care. There's a demoniac tendency within us which comes up. Demoniac means see, enjoyment itself is not a bad thing. Devutas also seek enjoyment, but they seek it within the boundaries of dharma. I want this, I want this right now, and I don't care who says what. So that is the karma with the krodha, the, the desire that rages against boundaries. So if this is happening, then this is the time we really need to take seriously. We need to be very careful. We need to maybe, sometimes it's helpful to have an accountability partner where now somebody else, we tell what are the struggles we are going through, what are the, sometimes, it's not easy, it is embarrassing for us, we would much rather keep our good image in everyone's eyes, but and having somebody whom we are accountable to is very helpful, because then they can, if we are taking things too lightly, they will warn us and they will help us. So broadly speaking, we have to see why a relapse has occurred and based on that, take the appropriate measure. Is the entire condition, conditioning is due to soul or due to subtle body? Subtle body. It's in the mind only. So, in this carelessness case, should one go on to cultivate desire, like guilt or something like that? Well, we have to take things seriously. Now, is guilt a part of it? See, somehow, 
I'm not sure whether guilt can be cultivated as such. Guilt depends on samskaras. Hmm? Some people speak lies and the only thing they feel bad after that is if they are caught while speaking lies. <laughs> they don't feel bad about speaking lies at all. So now can samskaras be changed? It can be. But uh, it's not that easy. So I don't know whether we can, I don't know if guilt can be cultivated. It is more that if guilt, we feel the guilt, uh, should we just try to run away from that and think of something else or should we dwell on it? When the guilt is like a, it's almost like a fire that burns within us. We, if we take our consciousness immediately away and don't think about it. It's easy, we do something wrong and don't think about it at all. We get busy in other things. So sometimes contemplating the gravity of what we have done, why, what is wrong with it, why it is wrong, that is helpful. Any last questions? Okay. Yes, Prom. Well, in the previous lecture, lectures, you told that uh, uh, for vision we need eyes, but uh, for comprehending the things we need intelligence. Yeah. So, how do you increase the comprehension level? Yeah. It's generally first by hearing, hearing, studying that helps us to learn, and then. After that is, we ourselves have to analyze where I need to use this. Hmm? It's like, uh, okay, if I understand that, okay, sense enjoyment leads to trouble, then therefore I don't want to indulge in sense. So I have to analyze where do I need to apply this? Where are the situations when this particular insight is important for me? For many people, the most important time, the only time when they remember sense enjoyment leads to misery is when they have to give a lecture to others. <laughs> that time is very long, but after that we forget it. Hmm? Now, after that, it's actually remembering at that time. Hmm? So, analyzing where, so generally I use this, that we want to go from vision to comprehension. Hmm? I use an acronym HARD for this. You know, we have to become hard, not in the sense of hard-hearted, but hard in the we have to become tough. So first is hearing, then analyzing. Analyzing, okay, where do I need to apply it? How is this relevant to my life? Hmm? Then after that is remembering at that time. Hmm? So, when to use it? Analyzing is when to use, when is needed. Remembering is, is to remembering to use it. And then the last part is what we can call as a debriefing. Debriefing means it's like reviewing. Okay, when this particular thing happened, did I actually remember it? How much did I remember? Or if I, if I forgot, what was the thinking? So it's like, it's more of review. Review whether we won or whether we lost, whatever, doesn't matter. In both cases, review it. So if I was able to resist a temptation, then what was it? Did I not notice it at all or notice it, but then I decided I won't get into it. Well, how was I able to pull myself away from it? So instead of just thinking I won, I have to analyze how did I win? Because it's not that just because I won the battle today means there's going to be no, no battle in the future. So we debrief, okay, what, what worked for me? And similarly, if it didn't work for me, why did it not work for me? So if you look at it from that perspective, we all can get more and more, the knowledge can become a part of us. Otherwise, it will just be something in the head and will not really transform our life. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shiva Kumar is really asking question. What is the difference between guilt and repentance? Uh, guilt and repentance. Mm. I'm not sure if there are precise Sanskrit words which uh, talk about the differentiation like that. So, generally speaking, mm, conscience is the basic faculty that we have. It's called Viveka Buddhi. Conscience is basically, it's our awareness. It's like innate awareness 
of right and wrong. So conscience is different from intelligence, although it's called Viveka Buddhi, it's slightly different from intelligence. Generally, intelligence acts at the level of reason. Conscience acts at the level of emotion. That means sometimes with our reason, with our logic, with our rational analysis, we can understand this is bad, I should not do this. But mm, conscience means that we just automatically feel bad. Hey, I should not be doing this. So conscience acts more at the level of emotion. Now conscience gives us a sense of right or wrong. Now of course our conscience can also be right or wrong. <laughs> that means <laughs> that is, it's not that always our conscience is right. I was talking with one one devotee in New Zealand. He said they you know they were they were from a family of fishermen for many generations. And he says, when I started practicing bhakti and I gave up eating fish, I felt guilty that I was betraying my family and my family's tradition. So now that guilt is not a spiritual guilt, it's more like a cultural guilt. It's like from, from our culture, we get a sense of right and wrong. So our basic sense of right and wrong may be itself wrong sometimes. <laughs> You're getting this point? But that sense is there within us. Hmm? So we want to make that, that capacity to feel right or wrong is there. We need to align it with align it by greater and greater purification. But conscience is the capacity to feel right or wrong. Intelligence is the capacity to reason what is right or wrong. They are two different things. Now when we do something wrong, at that time it is our conscience that makes us feel bad. That feeling bad is generally called as guilt. Now, guilt is the general word used in English. In Sanskrit, there are two words. There is um, prayaschitta. And there is paschata. Hmm? So, Paschata is more of internal. It is repentance. Prayaschitta is more physical. It's atonement. It is more, that means say for example, if somebody has done something wrong, they may decide I am going to fast. I will not take one meal. I will fast for one day. So, this is more external. It's physical. It's an expression of what we do. Now, so is now guilt can be broadly said to be synonymous to repentance. <coughs> but quite often the word guilt is used, now this depends on uses. Words don't have always fixed meanings. Words meaning also depend on context. But generally, the way I have seen the word guilt used in English. It's more of feeling bad about having done bad. Now repentance is more that I don't want to just feel bad, but then I start trying to do something about it. When I repent, repentance eventually is meant to lead to reform. So guilt is in one sense. Now guilt, you would say it can lead to repentance, but guilt may just stay, we may stay feel guilty without actually feeling repentant. Oh, I am such a, like, I said, I, I'm such, I did such a terrible thing, I am such a terrible person, life is terrible, everything is terrible, let everything stay terrible. It's like that. But repentance is more on the constructive journey. But that's just a technical thing. But broadly speaking, the important thing is that when we feel bad after having done something bad, hmm, that bad feeling is not bad. In fact, not having that bad feeling is really bad. Isn't it? So some people who do something bad, say if you step on somebody's foot and you notice it, oh I'm sorry, you say. But imagine if somebody steps on somebody's foot and they notice and they deliberately raise their foot and then bang it again. <laughs> you know, what kind of cruel person are you, isn't it? <laughs> so that is terrible thing. Okay. Yes, yeah, please. Nine, oh, ten o'clock. This is the last question. 
So by the way, before I answer that question, you know, this is all very easy to speak, and I'm not speaking this as if I'm acharya, I'm purified. We all have our struggles, and this is just uh, what I'm sharing is like weapons which can help in fighting the war. <laughs> but just because I know all the weapons doesn't mean I have won the war. You think we are all fellow warriors, and we are all fighting this. And these are weapons, and it's a it's a fight that, as Krishna says, prakshari vimokshana. It goes like flock. <coughs> now, what happens with time is we become seasoned warriors. As we become more seasoned warriors, then that means two things happen. One is that we can anticipate the attacks better, and then we can also bear the wounds better. It's not that a warrior will not become wounded. But we can learn to bear the wounds better, we can anticipate the attacks better. That's how it's it's a lifelong battle. So go ahead, please. Prabhuji, we learned that surges, uh, and that urges have surges, and yes. uh, we have to tolerate uh, for some time. But it, it happens that uh, sometimes it goes beyond the, our toleration level. Is it like possible to increase that tolerance level, our willpower? Is it possible to cultivate that so we can like more effectively uh, yeah. tolerate and resist? Yes, that's why I talk about relapses when they happen. You know, so why is the tolerance? Oh, why are the surges going up? Sometimes it may be because we exposed ourselves to some temptation. Maybe some provocation came out externally. We saw that and then the image is just replaying in our mind. So generally, when the surge happens, the surge can happen broadly due to some perception. Perception is external. We see something. The surge can happen due to recollection. That means, we have indulged in the past and that memory pops up. So basically there are two sources. Now the external perception we can try to avoid as much as possible. Now internal recollection can be avoided. Well yes, in one sense external perception what do we do is we redirect our attention. We may go somewhere, we don't focus on it. So same way some pop up might come inside. So for the inside also we avoid and we redirect. But sometimes it might just be like something that is right in the face and you just can't avoid it. That can happen in the external world, sometimes that can happen in the internal world also. So then it just takes time and practice. That, that abhyasa, if we keep doing, then it's possible. Like say if in arm wrestling I'm trying my very best but the other person is pushing my arm down then what can I do? Basically, I need to strengthen my arm. That means maybe eat proper food, do some exercise. So that is basically what we are doing in between the surges. So, it's not just a matter of willpower. Because willpower is uh, something which we have, but we all have it in a, in a particular quantity. See, willpower is like muscle power. Can it be increased? Of course it can be increased. But will it be increased overnight? No, it will take time. So I think that's what. So we have to look at the activities that strengthen us and do them more regularly. So in Krishna consciousness, we can find out which activity really uplifts us, which activity helps us become more immersed in Krishna and try to do that more. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Srila Prabhupada Ki Gaurabhakta Vrindaki Jaya Ayyaurabhakta Vrindaki Jaya Ayyaurabhakta Vrindaki Jaya